Welcome to chapter 15, the pricing chapter. As noted on the way through this course, price and services have a very interesting relationship in that price is a quality indicator and it's part of both the revenue and the IMC. So what you want to be looking at when we're doing the pricing of a service is ensuring that the price is now consistent with both the service you're delivering, the quality that you are implying through your physical delivery, your physical service scape, the quality that you are implying through your communication, and the quality that you are now implying by the price tag that you have placed on the service encounter. So there's a couple of things that we want to look at in terms of pricing. One of the facets of any form of marketing pricing is that you deal with both time, effort, energy, and money. And services is an interesting area where if we have a very high effort service, for example, personal training, there's a very high effort cost. At what point does the effort cost of self-service, self-delivery, that is, you're going to the gym, you're working out at a gym, you're paying someone to supervise you working out, at what point do you cross the threshold where you can self-service provide the skills, abilities and proficiencies that the service provider, in this case the personal trainer, is providing to you so that you can actually save yourself some money because you're still exerting all the effort. Similarly, in a service production, there are some points where we trade time for money that we will accept a premium price on a service if it can be performed quickly and we'll pay a premium price for a service if it can be extended in duration. So it's one of these facets where we again need to customize our thinking based on what we're dealing with. So what are we going to look at? We're going to look at the way services are priced, the way that value plays a role here and perception of value. And one of the things that we're particularly keen on talking about here is some of the strategic elements of pricing. So to kick this off, first thing we need to be clear about is that prices are themselves a challenge in service because of reference pricing. If you think about way back at the start of the chapters, we talked about the three different types of service. We were talking search, experience and credence. Well, the thing about services pricing is that they're quite often credence level in that you don't know if you got value. For example, you walk into a restaurant and it's an adequate meal at an adequate price. Are you, you know, you're thinking, well, how do I get decent value out of this? You go back to the same restaurant, you pay the same price, you buy the same meal, but this time the subjective factors, the purchasing factors, and the internal factors for you, you're at the restaurant with a group of friends, you know this place is okay, but you have a great time. I was like, well, hang on, this is a much better experience for the same price. So you reference prices are much harder to fix. Whereas with goods, you normally have fairly fixed reference prices with services because of the inconsistency, because of the inseparability, and because of the facets of the internal perceptions and your zone of tolerance, pricing gets to be a little more complicated for you as a consumer to determine if something is good value. You also quite frequently in services find the hidden price. And this is one of the most frustrating things as a consumer and also as a marketer, I find the idea that you would have a pricing structure that is price on application as your default is driving consumers away. It's lowering the reference price. It's also, to my personal and professional opinion, reducing your total market. Because if you can't tell me what the price is up front, and you're very much, oh, it depends, you know, if there are variables, fullness of time. I'm going to, my internal reference price at this point is that your pricing structure is not designed to suit my needs as much as it is designed to rip me off. Because my reference pricing is 
going to be looking at this of is this a fixed cost? Are they, okay, fixed plus variable. If it's completely variable, then what if I go as a benchmark? The last thing I'll say on pricing is that again, search some basic uh, pricing information is available in terms of price versus time. And we have metrics of price versus time for a variety of services. But the question we then have is, if it's the same service, for example, we're talking a haircut, and there are six different providers, and it's going to take you roughly the same length of time to get your haircuts, and the prices range from $25 to $250, your reference pricing matrix is going to be very difficult. From a consumer behavior perspective, collecting and assessing the price information and making comparisons between different price uh, contrast points and pain points is quite difficult. So I mentioned these briefly at the start, but non-monetary costs is a significant facet of services marketing. Because you are engaged in co-production, temporal costs, the time of consumption, and we know that time plays an influence in consumer behavior purchase decision making. And that time is a situational factor. So what we're also looking at here is when you're pricing a service, you need to be thinking, well, how much time am I asking a consumer to commit to this service in order to get the best return or even a basic financial uh, exchange? For example, Again, in transport, we have the flight from Canberra to Sydney, the bus from Canberra to Sydney, or the self-service drive from Canberra to Sydney. There are different time factors involved in each, and the price for the longest time tends to be the cheapest, because we assume that there is a trade-off between the speed at which you wish to get there and the price you're willing to pay to access. We also have in here a couple of the other uh, facets, particularly want to draw your attention to psychological costs. I'd like you to look at the search and convenience costs yourself. The psychological costs of a service are things like risk perception. So we have this problem where services are quite frequently unknown. And because if you're dealing with a credence or an experienced service, you don't fully understand what the service is going to do entail until you undertake the service itself. The psychological cost of uncertainty can be extremely high barrier to adoption. For people who like who have a strong locus of control, who like to exert control over their own life, who don't like to just hand off control, walking into a service where you don't know what the outcome of the encounter will be, you don't know how the encounter will work, and you're unfamiliar in your service role, it's going to be a high psychological cost. At the same time, going into, if you have a very low locus of control or you have uh, a much greater tolerance for variation, complexity, and various other psychological factors, a very strictly routinized, consistent service might be financially acceptable, but psychologically it's a very expensive thing because you're being chucked into a box, told to color in between the lines, and stay in your lane. It's really difficult for you to enjoy this service because there's no freedom, there's no ability to customize and modify. So non-monetary costs tie back into perceptions also of uh, zone of tolerance. They're gonna to come back into the elements in round rata. So we're gonna look at things like the reliability will link to time costs. Will the service start on time each time? When we're looking at things like assurance and empathy, these will be raising or lowering psychological costs. So what you need to be thinking about in pricing is how everything connects together. The other aspect to a psychological cost is that you don't necessarily want to lower the cost. Remembering that cost and quality link together, that the complexity of a task may be able to be sold as a high psychological cost that makes it a premium purchase. Only the best of the best can do this. We look at the things like the Tough Mudder runs where you are selling 
a financial cost, you're selling a time cost. So the registration fees, the training and the pre-preparation fees, and then you are selling pain, suffering, discomfort, in glory, failure, and everything physical that will happen to you over the course of running through an obstacle course, mud, other competitors, ramps, muscle strain, injury, you're selling this as a premium feature and people are buying it. So never underestimate the capacity to put up the price on the non-monetary costs as a quality metric. Because a lot of the time when we look at non-monetary costs, we're also, we tend to think towards, oh, how do I reduce the costs involved versus where do the costs sit in my positioning strategy? Where do the costs, what do the, these non-monetary costs communicate uh, in terms of my IMC? So the pricing elements, there are three types of prices that tend to, or basic pricing strategies, competition, demand, and cost. Now, the first thing I want to say is competition-based pricing is quite common where you don't really know your product. Uh, we see this a lot in consultancies, actually. People ask, you know, well, what would you charge? Uh, or people, got a group of friends who go into consultancy together have very similar fees because no one can really work out what they're worth. So if someone else is worth this, they'll take that sort of price. The challenge here is that you're not actually valuing your service, you're, valuing, you're using a competitor's frame, you don't know their cost structures, you don't know what your profitability is going to be compared to theirs. It's a difficult one. Cost-based pricing is also challenging because it's very easy to hide and lose the costs. That labor is a really difficult pricing structure. Your worth in terms of your preparation time as well as your service delivery time. If you take, for example, a custom commissioned piece of art, you're not buying the picture on the page. You're buying access to the skills of the artist. And this is one of these areas where there's a lot of downward pressure on pricing because people are like, oh, yeah, it's $20 for a piece of paper. But no, it's not $20 for a piece of paper. It's $200 because you have taken this person's time, you have taken this person's effort, you've used their opportunity cost, and you also need to pay that portion of the rent for the eight hours they were working on it, their food costs for those eight hours, and all the other facets that go with keeping this artist in business. Now the challenge here is to make certain that if you're doing cost-based, that your services are perceived to be worth what the actual cost is. That's a real challenge, particularly in areas that are towards the artistic end of the spectrum. So we're talking music, writing, art. Commissioned work in these areas tends to be driven down in an idea that there is some intrinsic reward that you get from producing this product, a intrinsic reward from the purpose and procedures of doing work and doing your job that we don't ask of people who work in accounting. And most people who work in accounting like numbers and enjoy their jobs. So we don't go to our tax accountant saying, look, you know, $300 for that's a bit high. I know you love accounting, so what about $150? You know, you're in accounting, it's your, it's your dream, it's your destiny, it's your, it's your job, let's push down your costs. So what's your perceived value? Demand-based is also a bit of a challenge here because you are going to basically play around with a lot of non-monetary costs as well. If you're in demand and there's a premium on your pri on your service, one of the other aspects you run into is the perception of value and the word of mouth trying to knock down the perception of your value because a former customer still wants your service, they just don't want to pay you a new price for it. So again, your challenge here, because services is communicated, you can frame your pricing, you can communicate a set of expectations, you can use the zone of tolerance theory in part of your pricing. What would someone, what would be the low end of their zone of tolerance for your price? What would be a price that delighted them? What would be a price that sat in the middle? So what's the upper end, highest price you can charge? What's the lower end, lowest price you can charge? 
to fit inside that zone of tolerance. So linking value and price is a really important facet. And this is one of the things that, in, again, in services, because perception links to quality, perceived quality and the amount of sacrifice involved in an individual's use of the service helps create the value. And value is a subjective element that you can modify. So perceived value and that whole idea of the zone of tolerance becomes important here when we're talking about monetary and non-monetary aspects. Because you can also have someone at the time feel that oh, you know, this was terribly expensive, this was terribly expensive, then over time realize, oh, that was good value to, wow, that was a bargain. I got so much out of this and yeah, I would pay twice the price for it in hindsight. They still won't pay twice the price next time, but they won't be trying to negotiate down your perceived value. So you want to look at this because what you're looking at here is the culmination in product, in distribution, and in promotion, you are creating a perception of value. Here in price, you are turning that perception, that psychological positioning, that point of reference in the consumer's head, you're turning it into a currency symbol and asking for that in cash, credit, or exchange. So let's talk about different conceptions of value for a moment. So value was one of those words that the AMA defines as practically in the eye of the beholder. It's one of these awkward things about marketing is that there are four different ways to see the one word and we haven't got different words for it yet. So when we talk about here as value is the idea of low price, we're talking about a market segment that wants it for the, their zone of tolerance is quite narrow. They've got a low reference price. They believe that good value is cheap. And they might not be resource poor. They might be resource quite heavily resourced and highly resourced. And they're very protective of their resources. So you've got the rich people who don't want to pay money for anything because they don't want to spend their money. And the reason they're rich is that they've been successfully not spending that money for an extended period. So if you're dealing with these people, and this is your market segment, and value is a perception of low price, there are a series of pricing strategies in the text here. Uh, penetration pricing is the one I want to mention. Penetration pricing is linked to new product introduction. So you want to be really careful when you're setting up your services that you don't come in with a new service at a greatly discounted price and then set the consumer's reference price for your service well below what it actually should be. And this is one of the dangers on penetration pricing for goods. But with goods you can show maturity, you can show product changes, you can change the shape of the packaging, say new and improved. And you create a perception that you can change the pricing. With penetration pricing and services, it's really difficult to change. If you come in low, it's difficult to get out of low. Discounting is also an option here where you can start at a higher price. So you can work your costs in terms of, you know it's gonna cost you $60 to, to perform the service. You want to charge 80, so you offer it at 100 and put a 20% discount off for loyal members. Therefore, they're getting it at 80. You're still getting your $20 profit. It's still working for you. So your second tier of pricing and value is where you start looking at things in terms of defining it by the experience of the service. Now this means that you've got an option here for higher end pricing. So what the customer is looking for and also looking to pay. A prestige pricing strategy here is great because the customer is well aware that they're getting everything they want out of the service. They're, you're hitting the delight end of the zone of tolerance. So you can charge a premium because you're doing well, you're satisfying their needs and the customer sees a good value trade. Now it's really important to charge prestige prices in these scenarios 
so that you maintain the quality of perception. As with the previous pricing strategy, skimming is also a new product pricing introduction approach. This is where you come in at your new offering of your service is positioned as exclusive, rare and expensive because you are trying to recover some of your product development costs. Product development, new product development in service is more difficult to position as skimming price because services are inconsistent and intangible. People occasionally can't see a new product service and see a new service as a uh, as a different. So you'll be looking at this going, well, what is this and how is this different to what you were offering previously? Why am I paying a premium for it? So you've got to be careful on your skimming pricing. On your prestige pricing, on the other hand, is don't forget that you can do prestige pricing on the non-financial costs as well. So difficulty, challenge, these are facets you can put in. Third quadrant, value is the price. The quality I get for the price I pay. The current, your segment here really understands that they are playing exchange, they are trading off. This is going to happen when there's a lot of competition in the market, when you are able to hold, uh, in a competitive market, you can hold very clear positioning strategies. It's also where you're going to play segmentation and you can charge differential rates for variations on a service product. So you know you can offer a discount cheap rate that is the bare bones. You can offer a service that's slightly enhanced with an additional set of features. You can even do this, and we see this quite a lot on the internet, we call it the freemium pricing model, where you have a free offer and several tiers of paid offer, which finish off on a premium, high-end, almost exclusive set of arrangements that are quite significantly higher. So you can start with a free product, a $5, $10, and $150 finisher, because you have divided up the audience and shown the audience clear differences in the value proposition. So this one's good. For, uh, this is a pricing strategy that works really well where you've got bundled services or where you can add on features. For example, we could sell this particular subject. We could have sold it as subject on its own, subject plus um, incorporated materials. So Slide, subject plus slides, subject plus slides plus textbook, subject plus slides plus textbook plus personal service delivery, subject plus, we could have uh, looked at these as different facets and different factors, so you can then send sell bundles and the market can choose which bundle it wants to engage with. Lastly, the value is all that I get for all that I give. This is basically where you are, this is an area of value that uh, you're looking at it from the point of view of almost outcomes based, almost like results based, as I said, the results based pricing, but you're looking at it of would you pay more for this subject based on the grade you got, or would you expect to pay a base rate for the subject and then the differential point you had between fail. So 49% through to 100%. If you got 100% of the subject, you got the subject for free. Again, you're playing around with pricing here to say, what does the market want? And here the customer uh, definition is the critical part. So again, it's a market segmentation, going back to some of your older strategy. So in summary, price, it is the wrap up. Uh, it's the close out of the semester. It's easy to feel that the last uh, slide deck is the least important slide deck. I do want you to still give this chapter its due credit. It comes in last because you can't do pricing in services until you have established your product offer, costed your product offer, positioned your offer through IMC, positioned your offer through ServiceScape, and worked out the delivery, the implementation, the actual how is this service going to take place through delivery and product so that you know what to charge, what it's going to cost in time, effort and energy, and what it should be communicating to 
the consumer in terms of value for their exchange of financial and non-financial investment. So this is the last deck of the season. As always, if you need me, at Stephen Dan or stephen.dan at anu.edu. It does close down. There's one final book chapter. Uh, we're not covering that because it's the economic impact of services. It's there for you to read at your leisure. Uh, this is the last of the content that will be within the assessment tasks. It does sit near the tail end of the semester, so its role really is going to show up in the exam. So that's a heads up. There'll be some opportunity to make use of pricing theory around the exam. And that's the pricing chapter.